Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I'd especially like to thank the crew for the Golden Rule for making historic Annapolis one of the stops as you go up the eastern coast. So thank you so much for coming here uh, today. Annapolis, again, you may not know, is one of the oldest cities in, uh, in the United States. Long, long, long history. So thank you for, for sharing with us and making us part of your itinerary. Um, now what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask uh, Mayor Buckley, County Executive uh, Pittman, and Senator Elta if they would like to make a, uh, uh, some, uh, some remarks. And Mr. Mayor. Can we go in order from uh, uh, state to <laughs> county? Can we go? Sure. Senator, would you like to be first? Sure, why not? <laughs> Thank you, Senator. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Well, we have just tremendous weather for this today. I'm just reading about this wonderful boat and, and everybody who supports its incredibly laudable effort. Um, I'm, I'm so happy that you chose to come to Annapolis truly as an ambassador for peace. And it's not necessarily a, a state issue or a county issue or a local issue, but every single one of us can learn lessons from your message and continue to be ambassadors for this incredible goal. So um, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for, for visiting District 30 in the great capital city, and I can't wait to take a tour. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, a lot of things I kind of want to say. Uh, that's all right. I'm sure it works really well. Um, so, I'm, I'm the county executive of Anne Arundel County, Stuart Pittman. Um, 1958, I guess, was when the protest took place. Um, and I can only imagine, I can hardly imagine, what it would be like after having stood on that boat and looked in, inside it, um, sailing out into the Pacific to stop a nuclear test. Um, I wasn't born yet, I was born in 61, um, and I heard a lot of stories about that time from my dad. Um, he fought in World War II, he worked on the Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe, and then he was Assistant Secretary of Defense for Civil Defense during the Kennedy administration. Um, right after, he, I think he, 60, 61, around the time I was born. And um, his job was to make sure that America was prepared for nuclear war, that cities could be evacuated and that there would be bomb shelters. And um, a lot of people considered that sort of a joke uh, to even try to survive a nuclear war, um, but he believed in it strongly that any life saved is worth saving. And um, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, when Kennedy called him in and asked what it would look like, how are we doing out there in our civil defense program? Looks like a war could happen. Um, you know, his answer was not so good. Um, and fortunately, we've avoided that war up until now. And I think we've become a little bit complacent about that and forgotten just what a threat hovers um, over the world because of these weapons. And um, hearing about how this boat got pulled out of the <laughs> pulled out of the water, restored, it sank, I guess, at one point. Um, uh, and brought back to life and now is traveling the, I don't know about the world, but at least the hemisphere, um, telling the story of what it did, inspiring people to work for peace, um, is just really amazing and we're so honored to have it right here in, in Annapolis. So thank you for being here and, and doing this work all over. Yeah. And I will second everything my friends here have said. This is a great time in the city of Annapolis because we are all aligned. We are all with you. Uh, Annapolis is a nuclear-free zone, um, we're, which we're very proud of. And we, it tends to stay that way. Um, but I don't think there has ever been a moment in history where your message hasn't been this important. We have authoritarian, authoritarian leaders um, throughout the world who are... Uh, rattling their sabers and threatening things that we thought would be unimaginable but now we turn on the TV and really it is a question you know how are we gonna look our kids in the eye how are we gonna look our grandkids in the eye and say we didn't stand up um, Annapolis stands with you um, this reminds me of the boat that I came across the Atlantic in to come to America a little 32 footer how many feet is this well, three, 30 four, <laughs> All right, um, uh, <laughs> it was in kind of about the same shape, you know. <laughs> but um, it really it sends a positive message. Um, I hope a ton of people come out here to see what you've done. I so appreciate the bravery of everybody that stand up. I feel at home. 
with a bunch of old hippies here. Thank you all. I'm, we're all hippies at heart. And uh, thank God for the hippies, right? Yes. Because, uh, yes. They've got a damn social conscience. Right. And uh, you are amazing. Uh, Annapolis loves you. Keep up this amazing work. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. I'm really happy that we're, we're here. I wanted to make sure people know that there's going to be a film screening and dis community discussion at the First Presbyterian Church of Annapolis tomorrow night at 7 p.m. And I hope you can all come to that. At that point, we will show the film that talks about the history of the Golden Rule. But from 1946 to 1958, the United States used 67 nuclear weapons on this small island community in the Marshall Islands at Anahuaytoc and Bikini Atolls, exposing the people there to levels of radiation that's caused a lot of cancer and birth defects, which will continue to reverberate through the generations because of the genetic damage it's done. So this group of Quakers sailed the Golden Rule towards the Marshall Islands, and when they were stopped in Honolulu, and another boat did make it to the Marshall Islands, it started this wave of protest against nuclear weapons, allowed President Kennedy to sign the Nuclear Weapons Test Ban Treaty of 1963, and inspired the founding of Greenpeace. Yeah. So you can imagine there's... You can imagine their surprise when Veterans for Peace discovered that this boat had just sunk in the waters of Humboldt Bay in far northern California, and they decided to restore her. It took five long years, from 2010 to 2015. And then we sailed her up and down the west coast for about five years. We were headed back to the Pacific because President Trump and um, Kim from North Korea were threatening each other with nuclear war. We thought it's time to take this little boat back into the Pacific to stop the possibility of nuclear war. We went to Hawaii, sailed all around the Hawaiian Islands, and just like the 1958 crew, we were stopped from leaving Honolulu. This time it was March of 2020, and COVID stopped us from going further. So we brought the Golden Rule back to California, thought about what we would do next, and we decided to do what's called the Great Loop. And there's something very popular with boaters, a few hundred do it every year. And it encompasses going down the inland waters of the United States, um, like the Mississippi River south, and then around the tip of Florida, up the east coast, through many possible ways into the Great Lakes, and then back down to the center of the country. That's the loop. Nobody ever does it starting in Minneapolis. <laughs> But we have a really great chapter of Veterans for Peace there, and they insisted that we come. And after three times of saying no, I said yes. So that's what we did and came down. We were going to go down the whole Mississippi River, but the drought prevented us from doing that. And we diverted to the normal way of going down the center of the country, which involves the Ohio, Tennessee, and Tom Bigby rivers. After going around the tip of Florida, we went over to Cuba for, for 10 days. and. Um, you know, took a look around, talked to a lot of people, went to a lot of different religious institutions, um, went to Pinar del Rio, which was wiped out by Hurricane Ian, brought some humanitarian aid to them. And then we headed up the East Coast, and this is as far as we've yeah. gotten so far. How about the Buca? Yeah, a really important star, stop that we made along the Mississippi River was Dubuque, Iowa. They have a population of 800 to 1,000 Marshall Islanders there. Well, now, we hadn't known that they were there, and they hadn't known the story of the Golden Rule trying to stop the weapons testing in their islands. And when we found out about each other, it was like, okay, let's get together. We had the most amazing weekend of welcomes and music and dancing and picnics there. It was, it was fantastic. And, you know, we got to learn more about their story, about why they come to the United States, which is their islands are becoming uninhabitable and they can't grow their own food and they can't eat the fish because of the radio, radioactive contamination there. 
So, yes, and, and will be forever contaminated. So um, they are allowed to, through the Compact of Free Association, to come to the United States. They can live here, they can work here. Uh, it's a lot harder or maybe impossible for them to become citizens. They've uh, been restored the ability to get medical care, thank goodness. For a while they could not be, uh, they could not use Medicaid. And so if you didn't have a lot of money, you couldn't even get Medicare, medical care when you got here. But now they can again, and that Compact of Free Association is up for renewal soon. So we hope they do a good job of making sure that the Marshall Islanders that the United States damaged can at least get good care here and are welcome in our country. How about the nuclear ban treaty? What's happening with that? When we talk... You're good, Jerry. He's <laughs> <laughs> your agenda. You're talking about this. When we talk to people, we talk about the humanitarian impact of a nuclear exchange of only 100 nuclear weapons could put enough soot and ash into the stratosphere to block out a significant amount of sunlight. That resulting crop failure would result in the death of about 2 billion people from starvation. That's only 100 nuclear weapons. Well, there's about 13,000 of them in the world today. What gives us hope is things like we, were reduced, we reduced the number of nuclear weapons from about 80,000 down to the 13,000 under the Reagan and Gorbachev negotiations. And things like nuclear weapons are now internationally illegal by the United Nations Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which went into force about two years ago when the 50th nation signed it and ratified it. So what we can do as cities, counties, and states is to push the federal government to ratify this treaty. And there's the um, international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. There we go. Thank you, Ellen. Good job. The, Thank you. And so the ICANN Cities Campaign is there to gather signatures from cities, counties, and states and all around the world to push for the abolition of nuclear weapons. So that's one thing they can do. Another thing you can do is divest from companies that produce nuclear weapons. So we've got some financial tools to use there. And we've got some political tools. We, you know, we're not far from Washington, D.C., where we just spent a couple of days passing out to members of Congress all the, the representatives and the senators, the Veterans for Peace Nuclear Posture Review. Now, the, the president in recent years has used a nuclear posture review to declare things like the United States will use nuclear weapons uh, as a first strike weapon against countries that use chemical and biological weapons or cyber warfare. Um, so. The United States is reserving the right to use nuclear weapons first, and that's part of our, their nuclear posture review. Our nuclear posture review is quite different. It comes from the idea that we can use cooperation and diplomacy to reduce and ultimately eliminate nuclear weapons. You know, if we use only 100 of those things, we're toast. So we have to work really hard to get rid of them. You can talk to your um, representatives about HRES 77, which is in favor of um, abolition of nuclear weapons and other measures to take us back from the brink of nuclear war. And there's the Eleanor Holmes Norton bill. What's that number now? Um, Eleanor Holmes Norton of Washington, D.C. Um, has perennially introduced a bill that's called the Nuclear Weapons Abolition and Economic and Energy Conversion Act. And she just reintroduced it a few days ago, and it's um, now got a lot of co-sponsors, and we hope that it starts gaining more and more traction to take, for example, the $2 trillion that we're spending on nuclear weapons and other systems and move that money into human needs and maybe towards cleanup of some of the nuclear waste problems that we have. Um, I'd like to introduce somebody to you that's really important to me. My husband, Jerry Condon, 
is the president of the Golden Rule Steering Committee, and mm -hmm. he's he was with us for that those lobby days that we did a couple, you know. And I think he might have a couple more things he'd like to share with you. Thank you, Helen. Well, the the mission of Veterans for Peace is ultimately to abolish nuclear weapons and to abolish war altogether. So we've been sailing this boat uh, for um, um, to get rid of all nuclear weapons, but also for a peaceful, sustainable future. And as we travel through the waters around the United States, we find that uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of problems with our waterways, a lot of pollution in the waterways. We've been actually highlighting that in recent days. Um, and um, along with Pat Elder here, who's taken such a leadership on this issue, you want to say a few words, Pat? That's okay, Jerry. Just to say, in uh, 2020, the Navy published a radiological contamination review of uh, the U.S. Naval Academy, and they have shown that there are about 40 different types of radiation, including uranium-238, uranium-239, and thorium, and other types of contaminants that are ongoing and um, it's something that few in the state know a whole lot about. Thanks, Jerry. Sure. Thank you for all your doing to bring that to light, Pat. And uh, so, you know, things have changed a bit since 1958. Uh, the crew, you know, the, the crew was four Quaker peace activists and the captain was a recently retired World War II Navy commander. And uh, uh, they were very, you know, Progressive, but they, they had, when they were planning the trip, they said, you know, uh, what about having a woman uh, as part of the crew? And uh, they said, no, no, no. There's really no room on this boat for a woman. I guess there's no women's room or something. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, now here we are in uh, in uh, tw what's what's the year? 2023. Uh, things have changed a bit, so uh, we've had a lot of women crew. We're at, right now, our crew is two men and two women, and I'd like to invite uh, one of the women up to say something. Well, it's a room. <laughs> we call it the head. It's very shared. <laughs> it's tight. My feet are too big for it. Mine too. Yeah. So in, uh, in the fall, I thought I was going somewhere, but I didn't know where. And uh, it was very intuitive. I went to a powwow, and I met Vets for Peace, who um, I've admired for many years, a lot of integrity. And um, they were tabling, as usual, as activists from the, the day. And I said, what, what you doing? What's on your plate? Oh, we're going to go down the Mississippi River in a peace boat. I'm like, well, that's pretty cool. <laughs> And the captain was there. He said, you should come. You should sign up. And I was laughing. I don't sail. I kayak. I canoe. And, uh, but I'll tell you, it was fascinating to follow my intuition because within three weeks I was on the boat. And I was blessed. Um, I'm a water person. Walk my dogs there every week. Um, and uh, really care about what happens to our communities, our environment. And I didn't expect to learn at each stop of the way that local chapters and their partners did such a great job of, of organizing to let the message come forward. And I was surprised. I didn't understand that, that the military and others have left behind chemicals. There's unexploded ordinance on the Mississippi in Savannah, Illinois. That's not the only place. Every city we stopped at there's huge stuff left behind, uh, both uh, related to nuclear production and other. And I've talked to a few county commissioners. They have regular meetings with the federal government about how to pay for the mitigation. There isn't a way. They put fences around stuff they can't recycle. So it's a story that was new to me. I didn't understand how pervasive it is. So as a community, we have to ask. How are we going to deal with this? How do we keep our communities healthy? How do we pay for this? How can we redirect funds so we're safer, right? I didn't expect to learn that on this trip. So it's my privilege, Chapter 25 in Minneapolis is why I'm here. And uh, it's my privilege to meet you all. Say and your name. I'm Mary Ann Vancura, <laughs> raised in Minnesota, lived in Texas.
believe in good government and good communities. Yeah. Here, here. I'll repeat, it's a privilege to be here. It's quite a blessing to be here. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this. Um, I've just joined uh, in Maryland Waters. I was born and raised in Baltimore. So um, when I found out this was part of the Great Loop, I had to be a part of it. And I originally got connected with the Golden Rule in Honolulu. That's where my home is. And um, I have a history of teaching peace studies in Japan. And um, when I heard there's a peace boat, what? <laughs> Great! And at that time, you know, the mission was still ongoing to get to the Marshall Islands and COVID happened and I actually was uh, given charge of taking care of this beautiful vessel while it was stranded in Honolulu. So I had the honor of coming once a week and pumping the bilge, <laughs> starting the engine and moving it when we had to, when we got mm, kicked out of certain well, there was limitation, time limitations for each dock, and I had to move the boat once in a while. Anyway, that was quite a privilege as well, and that um, instigated uh, my thinking in, well, if we have to cancel the trip to the Marshall Islands again, I can bring our local Marshallese community to the boat. So that was quite a privilege as well, to bring uh, a crew of Bikinians on board. That was wonderful. And um, uh, I can say that uh, my involvement in these issues began because uh, we were told in Honolulu that we had 20 minutes before an incoming, an incoming ballistic missile nuclear warhead was going to strike us. And um, I don't know if anybody here has had that shared experience. Please talk to me later if you have. But what do you do when you're told you have 20 minutes to live or to shelter in place? We were told we had two months of discussions with our local legislature what to do because um, Trump and Kim Jong-il were threatening each other, and Kim Jong-il was stating either Guam or Hawaii, well, we woke up at 8.15 one morning to an alarm on our devices saying, incoming ballistic missile, this is not a drill. So we had two months of preparation to know that, well, we have 20 minutes. We were told we have 20 minutes from uh, notice to impact. And we were told to shelter in place in an airless room and to seal all the doors and windows and to have provisions for two weeks. I mean, I don't know who did the studies to know that the air was going to be safe after two weeks. But this is what the discussions, the ongoing discussions were. At the time I taught in a school, all our, our faculty meetings were, what do we do with the kids? You know, we got to put duct tape on all the... Uh, the windows to seal them tight. Uh, we have to have enough water. Uh, we have to have kitty litter for the kids to use a toilet in a wastebasket. I mean, all these discussions were ongoing. What do we do if a parent knocks on the door after lockdown and insists their child has to come out? How do, you know, what do we do? Do we let the rest of the classroom get contaminated air while we let that one child go? I mean, it, all these discussions were just brewing before we got that alarm. This is not a drill. So how would you react? What would you do? I had a room in mind downstairs. Uh, my two kids were in Asia, so it was only me I had to think about and my two cats. So I was thinking, I need kitty litter for the cats and me. And uh, <laughs> I need food and water. And suddenly I looked at my watch and 20 minutes had passed and I hadn't really gotten very far. And I thought, oh, how strange. The alarms haven't gone off. So at that point, I just relaxed and said, well, do I really want to spend two weeks in an airless room? Do I really want to face what I'm going to have to face when I come out of that airless room? So I just decided to, you know, come what may. I'm not doing anything. 
and I came to some calm and some peace within me. But anyhow, um, it's quite a privilege to be here. That's my story, and um, thank you. Say your name. Oh, my name is Barbara Cooney. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you all for coming out to this welcome for the crew of the Golden Rule. I'd like to especially thank our elected representatives, uh, County Executive Pittman, Senator Elfrith, and Mayor Buckley for being with us uh, this uh, afternoon. And the, uh, the crew will still be around if you'd like to have an opportunity to chat with them individually. I'm sure they would be delighted uh, to that. And again, a very special welcome to the Golden Rule and its crew Thanks, for making Annapolis one of their, one of their stops. We are truly Truly grateful and supportive of you. Thank you all again. Thank you. Can we, can we get a picture with the crew? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah,